supposed to be on video game genres. Someone was supposed to moderate, but I guess that's nobody. Right? Yeah. We have another panelist. <gasps> what? Oh, yeah. Are you, you moderating? Again. You're moderating. <laughs> Done. Uh, that's that's, that's uh, right. Let's Good introduce luck. everyone. Introduce themselves. To start. Hey, I'm James Portnow. I'm the guy. I do stuff. Yeah, we do need another chair. Somebody have us a chair. I'm far from I'm busy moderating here, so. Uh, I'm Jeremy Pezner. I'm a veteran MAGFester, MAG05. Anyone else has been here that long? No. Good for you, guy over there. Uh, so, I'm currently a graduate student at Georgetown University, where I study a number of technology factors across the uh, spectrum of human-computer interaction and technology policy ah, issues. As I said, I've been coming to MAGFest for quite some time. I'm pretty familiar with the crowd and the way things work around here. I've also been involved with the Gaming Intellectuals panel for a number of years. As you see, I wore my professional outfit for the occasion. Yay! I don't need a microphone. It's not easy to pass back and forth. So uh, I'm Rim. I do a radio show along with Scott called Geek Nights, and we lecture widely at conventions like PAX Dev, PAX Australia, PAX East, PAX Prime. You might see a pattern there <laughs> on game design, game theory, practical game theory, theory of games, everything related to game and theory in some order we talk about. And by day, I design interfaces and I'm the product manager for a financial software company for global uh, equities and options trading and that sort of thing. I'm Scott. I'm the other host of the Eat Nice podcast. He's with me. Boo! Boo. Don't listen to it. Um, Don't listen to him. I have a computer <laughs> science degree, and I, my Steam account is way older than your Steam account, and that is why you should listen to what I have to say. <laughs> you win and achieve. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm Dr. Sean Cashman. I'm a professor of communication at Pfeiffer University down near Charlotte. Uh, I teach about games. I study games. I love to play games. And... Um, I'm going to pass that on. All right. I'm Vince Diamante. I am a music composer, audio designer at That Game Company, and I also teach video game design over at the University of Southern California. Okay, since I'm the de facto moderator, I guess we should get started. Who wants to, let's put themselves on the chopping block first. Well, I mean, okay, so the panel is what, video game genres, right? So I guess we know what a genre is, it's kind of obvious, right? Uh, do we? Do we do want we? to discuss that first? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right, fine, discuss that first, what's a genre? A, a miserable pile of secrets? <laughs> <laughs> to me, a genre, the way we use genres, and this is what bothers me, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go to the chopping block, you can wreck me up. To me, genres in gaming specifically are nothing more than a list of mechanics that we use to describe a game. First person platformer, third person shooter, massively multiplayer, online role playing game. We list some of the mechanics that we believe are core, and then make games that fall into not the list of mechanics, but to the basically sort of set of mechanics that were in the first game we gave that label to. So MMORPG to me doesn't mean massively multiplayer online role-playing game. It means WoW Asheron's Call Meridian 59 clone, and we call it an MMORPG. Well, I think <laughs> my thoughts on genre are fairly well unwrapped, but uh, it's almost ludicrous the way we approach genre in uh, video games, right? You look at something like, yeah, a first person shoot, right? Uh, we have no other medium in the history of humanity. Can you the microphone, please? So, take something like first person shooter. We have no other medium in the history of humanity which is defined by something like camera angle, right? We don't talk about uh, films by films which use the fisheye lens, right? Or films which use lots of close ups. And in fact, our, even our label, such as first person shooter, uh, is often a fallacy, right? Take Nicely done. Uh, I'm glad the water wasn't over there. Uh, so, take something like Mass Effect, right? Truth is, in Mass Effect, you spend the majority of your time third-person shooting. But we all know it's not a third-person shooter. Really, there's something at the heart of these genres. There's an emotive core to these genres. They actually mean something like a drama or like a romance. There's an emotive core. There's a reason that we go to these specific genres. And that's how we know that something like uh, Mass Effect is a role-playing game, even though it that's not how you spend most of your time, right? Or take Portal, right? Most of us think of it as a puzzle game rather than a first person shooter, even though what you're doing the entire time is shooting in first person. And so even though we label these by mechanics, 
That's not actually what they mean to us. And we really need to uh, re-examine these definitions and find ways to define them by the emotive reasons that we as players go to these genres in order to move forward as a industry. Uh, um, do we need to do that? I come from the music uh, world. You know, I'm a musician. I, I learned piano performance when I was a kid. And everyone accepts that mazurkas are mazurkas, and everyone accepts that fugues are fugues. You know, what is a fugue? A fugue is something that fugues, where you have multiple voices <laughs> and subjects that going between one. them. And those are low level, those are our low level mechanics in music. And we keep on identifying piece after piece, great pieces, as just the, by these low level mechanics. So at the same time, do, uh, does music not have a much longer history than video games so that these genres are able to become very well defined and we have a lexicon of sort of expert agreed upon language that has stood a long, long test of time as opposed to gaming. I mean, game, video gaming barely existed when I was born. Yeah, also, actually, consider a fugue, right? Is someone who likes one fugue, is that person gonna like fugues in general? Yes. Right, you think so? Yes. Right. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but somebody who like, but so. somebody who likes hip hop is like, well, you know, a, a genre is like a categorization to help people, you know, discover new things that are similar to other things that they might also enjoy, right? So if you label, say, something a first person shooter, like Team Fortress 2 and Tribes 2, right? They're both labeled as first person shooters. But if you like one, you might not like the other. They're crazy different. Right? I, I, Where, you know, is in music, like rock, yeah, okay, rock songs, you might not, you know, it's such a broad category, right? But maybe a more narrow category like black metal. If you like black metal, you're probably going to like the other black metal band down the street, too, because the category is actually pretty well defined. This is probably a good chance for me to jump in for a second. First of all, we'll take questions near the end. Um, so we'll, we'll reserve about maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes for those. Uh, but the way that I sort of consider genre in this medium, um, you know, many people would consider genre from a perspective of film studies, English, you know, wrapped up in the space of critical theory and, and matters like that. But I think in the case of, of this particular question, it might serve to use a cognitive approach as the one that is used in the discipline of human-computer interaction. In uh, one-way media such as music and film, uh, the effect that the, the expression of the piece does not change from uh, from viewing to viewing. It is always the same, and although different people will interpret it differently, the uh, the the process of the medium is, is constant, is, uh, is same, is unchanging. In games, however, that is very much not the case, and in fact they're very much defined by the interaction between the player and the medium itself. So I, consider, I think that examining a cognitive approach, quite literally, what parts of your brain does this game engage to, to in order to sort of help define genres? The, uh, the, the, how we may choose to define first-person shooters versus puzzle games, they do tend to engage different thinking processes, different modalities, different ways of sort of examining and reviewing your environment. Uh, and so one way, for example, that uh, I think this can be shown, for me at least, who thinks that first-person shooters and third-person shooters are different genres? Okay, so we get a few people, yeah. You know, maybe maybe a few people here and there. I'll tell you from my experience. I like playing third-person shooters. I don't like playing first-person shooters. But why is that? It's just, it's, it's really the only difference, as James mentioned, is the camera angle. That's the, the biggest difference between them. But why? Because your interaction as the player with the space and your avatar is entirely reconstituted simply by the changing of the angle. And because of that, I'm able to see my environment a lot better. I don't have to turn the character in order to see the enemies and the objects in my area of sight. It's just already there. Uh, similarly, House of the Dead and other sort of rail shooters sort of, again, sort of uh, alter that interaction with your space. And I might consider that a different genre than the traditional first-person shooter for that reason. Now, what's interesting is I don't have that same experience. To me, like, when I play games, a first-person or third-person shooter feels pretty much the same to me. It's just a matter of how I interface. And I actually like games where I can choose between them depending on the situation, but I don't, like, they don't feel different to me as a player on any fundamental level. And that's why I think genre is sort of, is not born out of anything inherent in the medium, but inherent is sort of the sum total of the interaction between the particular game and the particular player. I'd have to agree, actually, and this is a good opportunity for me to jump in. As a rhetorical scholar, Genre is a rhetorical term. Uh, for me, and the way that I approach genre, is that genre is a, a term that we use. It's something that we create. Something that we, a uh, concept that we, as a group, a society, a collective, create to understand 
something. We say, okay, these things over here, they share something in common that we recognize, and we go, oh, well, then we're going to categorize that. We're going to call it a genre. And these genres are fluid. They change over time. They have subgenres. There's all sorts of categories to them. But what's really key is how do these genres come about? And I think some of our speakers here have talked about that. Why is it we label these as first-person shooters? Who called it the first-person shooter at the beginning? And who puts it on the box and says this is a first-person shooter? Uh, so that's a question we should definitely consider. So who's creating these genres? Is it the companies creating it for us, or are we, the gamers, creating these genres, and the companies are stealing them when well, they see it? So as a designer, though, there is a real practical value to genres, and to we need a semantic language to talk about games. Um, and it is largely companies and marketing departments and uh, media personalities who have defined these genres because we need a way to categorize. We need a at-a-glance look that can be provided to the consumer to uh, quickly delve into what this product is. Um, but I think we can do that in a way that's more beneficial, right? There's a lot that we've done. There's a lot that uh, is in some ways holding back the medium by thinking about a first-person shooter as simply a first-person shooter, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think going back to what you were saying, which is where did these genres come from? And every, almost every video game genre I can think of goes back to one game, right? You think about platformers, you go back to Mario or maybe Donkey Kong, actually, right? And you think about RTS, you go back to Doom 2. And you think about FPS, you go back to Wolfenstein 3D, right? It's, it was always one game that just <laughs> was, was repeated, you know, people repeated on that theme and they cloned it and they modified it and they made variations, you know, until there were so many variations of that one idea that it became a genre. There's so many clone, you know, originally, like, you know, it was a Wolfenstein clone, a Doom clone, but then when there were enough of them, it became a genre, right? But you don't see, like, the Dig Dug genre, because no one's really made variations of Dig Dug. You know? It's like, you know, so what genre is Dig Dug? We've made up this arcade genre to sort of clump all those, you know, together, because in the early days, there weren't genres. Like, since the first one might have been the Space Invaders, you know, Galaga was maybe the first one that was, was repeated on. The Space one. I think that's a very good point. And to go back to Vincent's point about um, you know, genres throughout history, a lot of music came out of the time of the Renaissance when they were very much focused on sort of this new conception of, of, of arts in our world and sort of defining this structure and this logic and reason that sort of defined this art that was at once beautiful and sort of recognizable, had patterns. Uh, that's sort of a methodology that I think gave birth to a lot of the classical genres as we knew them. And, uh, you know, you know, as you see sort of later in the, you know, with the rebirth, as, as the development of rock uh, and other, you know, rock metals and the rock metal throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, those rules weren't necessarily there. So all of a sudden, we, you know, we had the Beatles taking from Jimi Hendrix, and then we had, you know, we had rap music, and all of those things were sort of taking and borrowing from one another in a much less structured and defined manner. So those genres, I think, have, uh, as a result, become less well-defined and much more blurred. Well, I mean, even in rock, even in rap, right, every time that we expand those genres to the point where they're functionally useless, then subcategorize, right? Grunge, punk. Um, so we, that can't stand, right? We don't have that explosion where we just blow out a genre because as humans, we have a need to subcategorize, to have that quick understanding. I wonder, to whom this categorization is important. Uh, uh, going back to music, you know, if you were going out to uh, listen to some music back in the 1600s or 1700s, you might not care that you're listening to sonatas or fugues. You'll probably just care, oh, is it opera seria or opera bufa? Is it serious or is it funny? Um, here in games, you know, this is a, this is a medium where if you're really involved in it, you're playing the games, and that's very different from just uh, being a spectator. And to whom are these genres really important? Is it the player, and, or is it the spectator? And maybe those are some different needs, and we have to actually categorize in different ways, low level versus high level, whatever. Like, for example, uh, Tribes 2 and Tribes Ascend. Very similar games on the surface. People would put them in the same genre, whatever that is, like maybe a large-scale, three-dimensional movie. You know, we makes up some genre for that type of game. 
but yet they're so different in the way they actually play out. And to me, I would almost put them in completely separate genres, like new metal versus new black metal versus new black death metal versus new black few death technical metal. <laughs> and then there's the chip and the only variant of that. So do we just have a tree that goes down to where at the end every game is in its own uselessly specific genre, and then different people just kind of go to whatever level of this tree they desire? Well, to, to why the genres are important, right? And I think what happens is, you know, there's a lot of people who, if you're a person who creates something, right? Think about Bill Gates, you know, whatever you think about Bill Gates. If you think Bill Gates, you know, he, what, what defines him? You don't say Bill Gates, guy who likes Porsches, even though he does and has a lot of them, right? You say Bill Gates, guy who created Windows, right? Guy who created whatever, that's, he created something. When you have not created something that is, that is big that you can define yourself, you define yourself, you identify you know, who you are by the things you consume, right? So if you are someone who plays FPSs, you say, or RTSs, you'd be like, I am Scott, FPS player, right? So if you define yourself according to this category of a group of things that you enjoy that are all similar, then it really does, it matters a lot to you what that means and what other people think it means, because then if you apply that label to yourself, that's what people think of you. You know, if you say, you know, if, if I say I'm a brony, right, it matters what people think of bronies. You know, what, what does that word mean to them versus what it means to me? And I'm going to jump in here too as well, and why genres are useful. Well, uh, a genre doesn't exist in isolation. Uh, you don't just have the Dig Dug genre, and <laughs> Dig Dug's there, and nobody else can get in there. A genre exists because there are other things that connect to it, because there are some similarities, something that they share, something that helps us to understand them. And that's the real key behind genre, is it does something for us. Now, uh, who's using it? Oh, we talked a little bit about that, the industry is using it a little bit, but so are critics. Critics use them all the time. Every time I read a review, the first line on a video game review is what kind of game it is. This is a third person shooter. And, and then they rattle off what makes it unique and what makes it different, but they also compare it. And that's really where genre becomes unique, is, is the comparisons. And I think that what we talked about, what was really talked about earlier, uh, was that we don't like those comparisons, the way we're comparing it now, because we're using mechanics to understand video game genres. And whereas with, say, film or books, we're using narrative elements. So we can look at cowboys versus aliens and go, uh, it's Western and they got aliens, so we got sci fi. Um, and it doesn't matter how they film it, they could film it, you know, from somebody's perspective, or they could, you know, like, Blair Witch Project, if they really wanted to, hideous if they could. Um, or they, you know, they could film it like Michael Bay style and everything blows up. Uh, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It's not going to change the genre at all. But with video games, that matters. Uh, is there a better mechanic, perhaps, or a better way in which? Well, I've noticed a subtle, subtle distinction between the way video gamers genre, like, classify their games versus tabletop gamers. And the tabletop gamers will almost always refer to specific other games in combination. They'll say, oh, this game is Power Grid plus Kalis. This game is Munchkin plus Poker. They'll, they'll like just list actual games. They almost never talk about genres. And only super hardcore people talk about genres in the video game way. Like I'll say, oh, it's a, you know, it's a open auction, you know, whatever kind of game with a draft. But I'll, then I'll explain it to anyone else who isn't hardcore. Oh yeah, it's like Kalis, but add some stuff from Aura and Labora. I have a theory about why that might be the case. With games like tabletop, you have, as we, you know, as we talk about, we're sort of defining games by, by face elements, by mechanics, by perspectives. In tabletop games, you have fewer of those. And so uh, the ones that do tend to innovate in a serious way will tend to stick out. You know, if you start, start to talk about you know, games that are, you know, that are a combination of two specific other games, I mean, how many different types of video games are there? You know, unless there are stuff that are, unless there are particular games that are very well known and very famous, if I start to talk about a game as a combination of two other ones, probably not everyone in this room would know what I was talking about. Um, and so I think it, it also serves to sort of go back to what I was saying before, how sort of mechanics are a proxy for the user experience, for what the gamer is doing, or what the gamer wants to be doing. You know, are, are you the type of person who likes to solve puzzles? Are you like the type of person who likes to press buttons in a very defined uh, sequence in order to do something? Are you the type of person who likes to react quickly to stimuli that come jump on the screen? Those, I think, rather than, you know, starting to, those base elements, rather than trying to use mechanics as a proxy for them, might be more effective in sort of trying to categorize genres. If we go back to Dig Dug, what kind of game is Dig Dug? Well, you go around and you try and stop enemies that are trying to do something, and it requires a lot of 
Yeah. Yeah, I think I used to find about, you know. So should we have a cathartic violence genre? <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> I actually, I mean, we joke about something like that, but to me, really, we do have to consider the core reasons that we go to these, and I don't think, I think cathartic violence may be too specific, but there are a number of games that we play to feel powerful, right? Um, there are a number of games that we go to play to escape our daily lives, right? To enter a different world. There are fundamental needs, and I actually believe you can break down these fundamental needs into a fairly small handful, maybe two dozen categories, um, that we can uh, attach to pretty much every game that so far has come into existence. So, yes, I actually do think that we should talk about what emotive reasons we approach these games for. And cathartic violence may be too specific, but not by much. <laughs> but then there's the, the differential of experience. I mean, I play Hotline Miami, a very ultra-violent, minimalist game that came out recently that I'd recommend you all try out. But to me, it's a like deconstruction of like late 90s violent action movies. So to me, it's purely the sort of deconstruction of a genre exercise with really good music, while someone else might take it as a very cathartic, powerful, you know, violence fantasy. Yeah, I took it as a Robotron shooter that's more advanced. Uh, stealth Robotron is how I saw it. I, I think that's BS. It's not Robotron. It's Robotron. Well, but so in the second case, we're getting to uh, mechanics definitions again, right? But in the first case, uh, I, I mean, I agree. You literally gave the two that we had just talked about, right? It, it's a fantasy. It's a very specific fantasy, and it's a um, uh, and in some ways, it's a power simulator. And so, I mean, I think that there are a limited number of these that we can go through the list and look for why we why we want to go to these things and as long as we make those reasonably broad i mean it's it's a exercise in finding the right semantics which is always very very difficult well i mean yeah, you know you, it is, it, we say we keep trying to get away, away from the technical definition of the genre right but it depends you know on on which mechanic you're talking about like where the camera is that's not a mechanic that really defines the genre right but the skills being tested that is a mechanic that makes it a different kind of game right so what if we took the hotline miami and we use the exact same game mechanically speaking push the same buttons to win everything like that but instead of it being about this violent you know hitman right we just change all the pixels to make it be about you know dinosaurs right <laughs> is it now a different genre i i mean i'm a I believe the mechanics would still deliver on the power fitness action. Um, but uh, in general, right, we have games with nearly identical mechanics that we view as radically different, right? And so, to me, uh, while as a designer and a very mechanics and systems first designer, um, I I would like to be able to argue in favor of mechanics. I actually think that uh, we can deliver anything through mechanics. Uh, you can find a way to deliver on any emotive core through the mechanics of your choice, just like you can through any literary style or musical style, right? Um, and so I actually do think that the mechanics are secondary, but some mechanics are uh, better at delivering on specific emotive sets, just like certain musical styles are better at delivering through emotive sets. Oh, we're all pondering. If these were easy questions, we wouldn't be up here. <laughs> so, can I throw in a question if you're thinking? Yeah, all right. Looks like we can we can fill the silence with a question. Well, how much time is here? Hold on. We, we've got plenty of time. All right, we'll, 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 we'll riff on these questions and see where it takes us. Go ahead. So, uh, how would you, I mean, the reason that I think that video games are defined by mechanics mostly more than the emotive reasons we play up till now have been because most games have relied upon mechanics to enforce play uh, rather than giving you any emotional reaction at all. You would play Tetris for hours, but without even thinking about any kind of story or narrative. So this is actually perfect. Um, so we talk about emotion in far too limited a sense, right? We think about these emotions, uh, joy, anger, sadness, right? But there's a much greater spectrum. And I, I don't know if you, know, you guys have seen the episode we did on it, but uh, I would refer everyone to the Mechanics and Aesthetics paper, which came out God, a decade ago now. Uh, where they break stuff down, right? What you said right there, without thinking about any of this stuff, they talk about this mechanic of submission or abnegation, where you as a human being 
want to kill time. We actually all have at times the desire to simply tune out, right? That is an emotive need we actually have, a documented emotive need. And that's exactly what that aspect of Tetris or the Jewels provides us, right? You can play around with it and just let it all go. And so I think we have to think further than simply our standard uh, set of sort of interpersonal emotions to really what needs these things to fit. So the killing time genre, that sounds like just about, every, just about every smartphone game out there. That might be the genre of Angry Birds. Well, I've never played one of those games except when I was bored and waiting for something. <laughs> okay, in the front. Uh, yeah, um, that's, you know, uh, defining games by the emotion or the thing we want to have fulfilled is an interesting idea, but we don't define anything else in that way. We okay. certainly think about those things, but you know, we don't think of it solely like that. We don't say, well, like, oh, well, Grave of the Fireflies is an anime you want to watch when you want to think about killing yourself. Well, well anime, <laughs> anime is a specific problem in which uh, they, it, it's people mistake the medium for a genre, right? You know, <laughs> anime, there's so many genres of anime, right? But because of just, you know, the perspective and the marketing, especially outside of Japan, people think of anime as a genre, right? Gotta, but that's a confusion, which is a mistake, right? Genre, yeah. no, I, exactly. It's the same way as, like, people think of, you know, Table like RPGs, as, you know, tabletop RPGs as a genre. No, it's a medium. There are so many genres of tabletop. I've got a funny story yeah. for that. I used to work for Blockbusters when they existed, <laughs> and they had an anime section. Yep. You know, we'd have romance, we'd have all this stuff. We had an anime section, so you would find Pokemon right next to a rock sock doji, <laughs> which is you know, children's, you know, cockfighting with uh, <laughs> hardcore porn. So we got to be very careful when we say, you know, the, you know, the medium is a genre on its own. Now, I also think we do describe media the way you said we don't. Look at, like, if we say film noir, <laughs> film noir actually is a very specific emotional characteristic. It evokes very specific responses. It's a fairly narrow genre, despite the fact that people use the term broadly. I mean, a film noir movie, they're almost all the same. Well, there's certain people argue film noir was a movement and not a genre. Yeah. <laughs> or a style. Or a style. Or a style. <laughs> but the thing, think about <laughs> romance, <laughs> right? <laughs> romance is the easiest example. We talk about lots of things. We about romance novels or romantic <laughs> comedy. And that's a specific emotion motive need you're going for. Usually the same is actually true with drama or action. These are specific emotive needs you're going to fill by going and saying, I really feel like an action movie today. We know what action means in an emotive sense in a way that we don't with FPS. A film noir hero is always the stone cold, yeah. womanizing, drinking guy who pushes himself to the edge. And I'm going to get that fantasy, either being him, opposing him, all of your, I guess, all the things you're getting out of the movie are centered around that core construct. So we define the genre by that, and a few other things, and occasionally <coughs> camera angles and lighting, but those are all secondary to the stone-cold main character, the, you know, the typical film noir, you know, seductress female that comes in, the secretary, all these different characters come into play. And it sounds like this inconsistency in genre development, how one thing is considered a genre for these reasons, and something is considered a genre for those reasons. Is well works well in support of James's idea. The idea that you know, no matter how these things developed or came into being, they all sort of serve this particular emotive or motivational need. Uh, sort of goes back to what I was saying about the the interactions between the system and the player. So really, that might just be the best way to describe it. What's going on for you, the viewer, the player, rather than what's going on for it? You know, the stuff feeding information to you. Because at the matter of the day, at the end of the day, you're the one who matters. All right, uh, the red shirt. <laughs> media, books, films, music, whatever, um, I would say that generally speaking, genre, the word genre describes like stylistic elements, thematic elements, content of, you know, whatever it is you're watching, your book, movie, whatever. Um, but then with games, I would say the word genre, as we talked about, is more of a technical element, and basically it's kind of a two-part question. What? <coughs> or if, if you guys even can guess, why is there that gap? between, you know, the, the way genre works, and also, um, would, would using genre more as we do for other media, for games, would that help or hurt the gaming industry? 
To get into the first question, and I think it goes back to what we were just saying, the fact that what is going to evoke a specific response or emotion, fulfilled emotive need in you, the player. Uh, for stories, for, for, for story-based media such as film and books, the story elements are what they have. For games, all of a sudden we have this, all of a sudden this entirely new dynamic, the mechanics, the technical, the stuff that enables you, the player, to accomplish something and to, to feel a certain way in so doing. So the really question, just so again, I think, I think in terms of trying to think of genre in terms of the elements embedded in the media itself it is ultimately going to run into all these inconsistencies and confusions. It's, I think it's better to think about what effect does this have on the viewer. Honestly, I think the disparity is just that gaming is a very new phenomenon. I mean, we've had chess in certain kinds of abstract games for thousands of years, but there was, in most literature from ancient times, you won't find any descriptions of genres. Games are just referred to as games. Generic words are used to refer to games. Rules are never very clearly coded. It's only recently we have designed games as opposed to games that evolved, and only recently we even have video games. I think it's just like much like how music evolved, we just haven't evolved the lexicon yet, and I think it's just going to happen naturally. I just think that because we're so connected, it's very easy for us to see the fact that we don't have a lexicon yet, and we can't just wait a hundred years for it to kind of sort itself out. I think it's also that there, you know, we, we talk about gamers, right? We're one big community, we all sort of come together, but really, you know, many of us are quite different in our tastes in gaming, right? I see a lot of people, you know, and it, it covers an entire gray scale, but I'm just gonna give you the two hyperboles, right? Is the person who likes games and that they really like the theme. Like, you make a game and it's a Western, and they're like, oh my God, that's so awesome. Like, they get off on the cowboys and the horses and that part, right? You take the exact same game and exact same game, replace those cowboys and horses with spacemen, and they don't like it anymore, right? Even though it's the exact same, you do the exact same stuff, right? Because the most of that person, the way they are, they get more of their enjoyment from those thematic story elements and, and you know, surface level, you know, stylings and things of that nature. And then you have another person who gets off on the game part and they wouldn't care if it was black stick figures everywhere, right? Because what they're doing in the game, they're so into it, right? You can take Star, you know, Starcraft and Warcraft 3, it's fantasy and sci-fi. There might be someone who only likes fantasy, they only like Warcraft. Another person only likes Starcraft because they only like sci-fi. Another guy likes, you know, the, the strat, you know, clicking really, really fast with his fingers. He likes both. Okay? And it, this is reflected, actually, in uh, the academics as well. For many years, academics refused to admit that video games could have narrative elements. <laughs> we, we, we said they don't tell stories. People experience them, and people don't experience stories. Made no sense. But the argument's still raging in certain small corners. As to the second part of your question, how this affects the industry, uh, to me, our problem with genre has clearly had already a profound effect on the industry. Um, discussing these things with other designers, I've come across this problem, this fallacy of seeing genres as mechanics, uh, which has led to the downfall of whole genres, right? I believe that the adventure game genre and the horror genre have both uh, sort of fallen by the wayside, died, not because there's anything bad about those genres, right? Not that we have no longer have the human need that those things provided, but rather because people started just pulling the mechanics and not realizing how those mechanics filled the need that people were going to those genres for. This is very evident if you see most modern horror games. Or look at a crazy example, massive game. We talk about massive games, they're all either an MMO or there's something like Planet Side, which is still a lot like an MMO, even though it was FPS and whatever. Why don't we make a massive game that's the Battle of Endor over and over again, 10,000 people at a time, once. It's stateless, there's no leveling up, there's, it's just, everyone's in a TIE fighter, go for it, it takes four hours. Right, and this is the harm to the industry is that, you know, publishers especially don't want to invest in anything risky. So they go, you know, they want to, they say, you're making something crazy different than anything's been done before, we don't want to put our money in that, you know, incredibly sinky ship, right? We want to put in something we know has worked many times over. So, you know, there hasn't been a game like TIE fighter in a free space shooter in how long, right? No one's gonna, you know, put a zillion dollars making one of those. Well, first of all, I just need to pull the room. How many people would play the Battle of Endor over and over again? Yeah. There we go. You can, you're not going to be Luke Skywalker, guys. You're going to be that guy on the Death Star with the turret going, do you No, I'm going to be the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I like the receptor, And he's a board <laughs> You know everyone's just going to want to play as the Ewoks. <laughs> I kind of do now. <laughs> In the back of the black coat. So, um, 
Interesting thing that happened a while back, um, Konami has been trying for the longest time to patent the music game genre. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this patent, it's got things such as having a display that says whether you've got a good time or not, and things like that. And so a lot of little games, um, if that's familiar with in group, have been kind of pushed down because of things like that. Uh, I just had a lost point. We're, we're deep in our genre. <laughs> at what point do you draw the line for something that's copyright? At what point is a game? With that lawsuit, I just did a ton of research on this for a lecture we did at PAX very recently. We talked to the history of DDR in 20 minutes. In the groove, in the end, it was settled because they couldn't really, like the case was pretty indeterminate, but it came down to the mechanics were not really the problem where they go after them. They went after them for the dressage of the game itself and the fact that in the groove was selling upgrade kits to turn a DDR machine into an in the groove machine. Had they not done that, and had they not used a lot of very direct and blatant stylistic elements, it would have been totally fine by every legal reading I've seen. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, you look, the machines were identical. They put lights up in the top. They had the same size speakers down below, right? It was, it was the same exact deal. So they got in trouble in, in that way. But if you made a game with four arrows that you step on to music, and it didn't resemble DDR in any way, or if you made Beat Mania where there was, you know, the, the buttons and the spinny thing, right? DJ Hero didn't really get in trouble, right? So. The question of what's patentable is a, a, a ridiculous question we get expended in entire semester on, in fact, I just did. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, so I think so, it's sort of important to sort of, in that question, it's sort of important to tease out the intellectual property questions with the questions of, of games. And that's sort of, it's, in fact, that's another reason these things sort of work adversely towards one another. In, in, in software and games especially, you want to be able to quantify something, to be able to define it, to be able to, for the purposes of law and society, to be able to point it out over and over and over again. Whereas, you know, in the creative works, you want to be able to sort of not see these things as so uh, fixed and see them as more fluid and reconstitutable. So I'm actually given a much shorter answer. Mechanics just aren't patentable. Um, Wizards of the Coast has owned the copyright to trading card game for 20 years now. We've seen how few trading card games there are. Um, uh, there are example after example of this, right? Look at the iPhone store and see how many games there are out there like Angry Birds, right? Angry Nerds, Angry Pigs, but, Angry Birds. Uh, mechanics at this point in time are not, copyright is not enforceable on mechanics, so it becomes somewhat less of a concern. It's like the dude who copyrighted the word edge, right? Irritating people will try it, but in the end, that'll be true of any definition of genre, and we're gonna have one, and no copyright's gonna succeed on it. Okay, and the red shirt? <coughs> Those, yeah. um, I was thinking the main difference between like video games or any kind of gaming and other media is the interactivity. And so for that, you know, you kind of need a genre description that defines in what way you're interacting with the media. Um, and that's kind of the, the difference there. The problem is that interaction is not a universal concept. Um, as we sort of have been talking about, people, different people are going to react to different things differently. I, I mentioned this thing earlier on about the first person versus third person thing. For me, that's a very big difference. For others, not so much. And, you know, so that can oftentimes change the gaming experience depending on who the person is. Interaction is a two-way street. And when we're not, we're not just, while this game or itself may be unchanging from person to person, every person is different. And they're going to bring different conceptions and different ideas to it. In fact, when we talked about, you know, in fact, to go back to that question of whether a reskinned game with the exact same mechanics is appealing to one person or another, I remember reading this one view for uh, the Metroid game for the Wii, and or maybe maybe it wasn't that, but it was one of those well-known series. And I think they said if this were a new series all on its own, this, these mechanics flaws would be less forgivable, would be more forgivable. And I said, wait, how does that make sense? <laughs> it should be a good game or a bad game, depending, you know, no matter who it is. But you know, when you put these characters in this world on top of it, it brings all these preconceptions and different ideas to it that dramatically change is the objective interaction that you'll bring to it. Um, this is kind of related, but I've sort of toyed around with the idea of if we lived in a world where we didn't really have genres, but there were these really strong walls that existed between the systems, you know, Wii, Xbox 360, Arcade, you know, stick with three buttons, stick with six buttons. And just going back to music, you do kind of have that divide there. There are people who are pianists, and there are people who are violinists. And actually, the music that arises out of that 
is quite different because of the capability of the system. You know, the Wii, you get very different stuff. You have very different input into it. You don't necessarily have a uh, very different output, but that's a problem with the developers, honestly. Um, but uh, there, there is something there with how people interact with the piano, the violin, the, or, or even a conductor in front of an orchestra. You have that capability. Uh, let alone, you know, we talk about music and gaming, improvisational music, jam sessions. Is that, is that, any, is that not a game? You're playing, you have a set of rules, a set of genres, and you're playing along with someone else. You have a mutual sort of lexicon, but in a way it's a game. You're trying to show off to each other and to your audience in the confines of this sort of particular space. If you miss a note, you play out of key, you hit a, a bad accidental, then it's almost like you've missed a note in Dead Sense Revolution. <laughs> I have uh, one thing before we go to some other questions here, is the dangers of Java. And this is something we kind of talked about, at least when we get to the industry. When we have a video game that does very, very well, Call of Duty, <laughs> does very, very well, what we end up seeing within the industry is they will label it as a genre, and then every other game that comes out looks exactly <coughs> like Call of Duty. Oh, oh, oh. So the problem is that usually, uh, this is the problem with choosing genres by mechanic. Uh, there are plenty of places where I've consulted at, plenty of places where I've worked at, where you're literally presented a checklist, right? Uh, we, for our market portfolio, need a third-person shooter, and then there is a checklist, right, for what a third-person shooter is. It includes these things that Gears of War also had. Um, I have literally gotten a design doc back in the days when we actually did design docs. I had a design doc back at one point with just in red pen on the front. Looks great, guys, but can you make it more like Gears of War? Um, nothing else, no other comments. Um, and, uh, so this is the problem of genres, right? Genres are inherently a box that we're limiting ourselves to, and in the corporate world, that box becomes much stronger. Well, visual novels are a genre that really doesn't exist in America, except in very indie projects. In Japan, they're just a common genre. I think they're gonna explode here eventually because people are gonna discover them, but we don't have those. We, we have adventure games, which are very pretty solidly distinct. A visual novel is almost more like a really interactive choose-your-own-adventure book. Is a visual novel even a game, though? That's a good question. And this is where the genre thing works. Right. Well, <laughs> 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 we had a whole panel last year trying to define the definition of a game. It took about an hour to come to an almost consensus. <laughs> Obviously, the biggest, uh, you know, we all know the biggest cause of this box of genre that publishers put you in is their risk aversity yeah. to new things and such. But one of the, uh, you know, secondary reasons that you get this box of genre that people don't think about too often is if you want to make a game that is different from previous games, that is a lot more work in coding, and, right? If you just want to make another first-person shooter, you just take, you know, an engine out of the box and load it up, and it's a lot less, you know, laborious to do so. So, so the cost of production are, are decreased. I mean, it's kind of true, but kind of not. Like, you look at most of the indie games today, right, that are radically different, cost way less. But that's, that's the, you know, because those are, those are smaller games that don't have the potential to make, you know, even Minecraft didn't make, you know, as much money, it made tons of money, but it didn't make as much money as, like, the biggest, biggest games, right? It's but on the other hand, it made a, a ton of, sure, it didn't make as much as Call of Duty, it made a ton more than Medal of Honor, right? Yeah. Cost a ton less than Medal of Honor. Dude. And so, I mean, I think it's, it's also in terms of how we think about it, although you're right, the tools being built are in some ways being built around genre, right? I mean, Unreal Engine is very specific and very hard to leverage out its first person -ness. Well, our genre is not also sort of pushing this, like you said, there's a list of requirements for a game to be a third person shooter. Some of the, some genres of games seem to require, they have to be a triple A game with these certain, like, like they have to have certain levels of graphics and things. That's a checkbox that you don't have with the indie games. I mean, Minecraft didn't need to be, you know, 1920 by 1080 with 120 frames per second and like voxel shaders and 3D cameras, but those would be line items on a different kind of game. Well, and like, think about Binding of Isaac, right? Binding of Isaac is a pretty good game, right? I liked it. Uh, but but, you know, and it is totally pretty different from everything's out there. It's like a Zelda and a roguelike and you know, all this cool stuff, right? But because it wasn't built on existing tools, right? There wasn't some sort of engine you just get out of the box of Binding of Isaac engine, right? It doesn't have joystick support. And these sorts of things are lost, you know, and they, they, because the indie games choose not to build those features, that is part of the reason that their costs are significantly reduced, whereas, you know, a big company couldn't put out a game without all those necessary features, setting your resolution properly, full screen that works, you know, all these sorts of things going on. Indie games themselves aren't becoming a genre. 
So a lot of people talk about the, the indie versus the AAA titles. So indie's becoming a movement, and it's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> I think one reason... What's the, what's the famous comic? I'm gonna make an indie game that's unlike any game that's ever happened before. Pixel art to be platformer. <laughs> So there can be an inherent danger in that, but I think one reason that the one reason that the indie games movement is exploding is because people are getting sort of getting tired of this, these these repeated clone movements. The idea that this next FPS looks has to look like like the last FPS within the indie movement, there are in fact all sorts of familiar genres, but they are able to sort of be more different in ways that ways that these publishers would not necessarily let a, a larger title be. Isn't that true? Isn't the indie thing stuff true though with? All the mediums, we're talking a lot more now about indie movies, indie comics, uh, indie music than we were uh, a few years ago. That's true, but I never hear of, I mean, and there are definitely independent film festivals, but I'm not, I still believe that in those, and I, I wouldn't know this, anybody here could to let me know, but I, even in those festivals, I believe that there are, uh, they still talk about film genres. Again, for all the reasons we've discussed about why film is, and, and I might be more adaptable to genre than, say, games are. Um, so, um, in the orange shirt? Uh, so instead of calling them like limited ammo, third person puzzle shooters, why do you think uh, survival horror, like specifically, is kind of escaped being labeled by its mechanics? Even now. Hmm. Well, so uh, I would. Oh, do you have a. Because I, I saw you dying to get in on the last. Do you want to jump in on the last one that I can answer this one? <laughs> okay. Well, I got to refresh. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what was I saying? Oh, we were talking a, a lot about sort of the industry and publishers. Yep. I was going to mention in Japan, you go to the big magazine, which is Famitsu. Yep. And, and every issue for the last uh, two and a half decades, they have a table of all the genres that exist. Yep. And it's gone up to the point where they have 27 different three or four letter acronyms there. And it's, and it's actually really troubling. Every game has to have a genre. Um, so I was involved in the game Flower, and it had to have a genre attached to it by Sony Japan, and they were really pushing us to give it a genre. And then in the end, someone over there said, it's a Zen simulation game, Z.SLG. <laughs> um, but actually, Zen dot simulation life game is what they call it. I think Osmos would be an outside genre. Say there's other games in that genre. So, okay, we, we have a genre that's great. <laughs> cool, we're not alone. You should have just been like, it's, it's a not. third party, third person platformer. Cool. <laughs> 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 over platforms. Exactly. Well, there was one big platform. <laughs> um, but you've hit on a really good point here, is that we've co-opted a genre from other media in times and games when we just don't know what to do. It's survival horror, it's just their, you know, most of the Resident Evil games are third-person shooters in some way or another. But we don't call them that, we call them survival horror or sports games. You could have a first-person baseball game if you want to. You know, have the baseball bat go up and hit. We don't have those, but you could. We wouldn't call it a first-person shooter, we'd call it a sports game. So there are times where we borrow from other media for whatever reason in terms of trying to understand these genres, and we haven't quite I, I think this is the problem with using the mechanics, is that it doesn't always work. And so sometimes we, we go, oh, we'll borrow from film here. And Well, I think I know, I've noticed, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but I've seen quite a few people who failed in the film industry or who went to school for film and tried to do film and did not make it, and they went to video games, and they apply their film knowledge to video games. And this is where you get those video games that are nothing but cutscenes a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Saga. Um, right? yeah. 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 So, real quick to address the survival horror question. Survival horror was one of the only genres in video games to have been labeled by its emotive core uh, when it began, right? Because we understood horror. We understood it from other things, right? And it was also one of the only other, only genres out there. Um, in the broadest of senses, most video games deliver fun. Survival horror games do not deliver fun. It's engagement, it's an emotion that you want, right? But being scared is different than fun. Um, and we, on some level, fundamentally understood that and were able to label it that way from the outset in a way that we haven't been able to with other genres. But did we not then ruin that? When I hear survival horror, I right. think tank controls, limited ammo, third-person shooter, with right. cutscenes, and maybe quick time events. And this might, I think that actually points to a somewhat more uh, a mechanistic side of things. That in, you know, in, in games that we might consider true survival horror, like say Clock Tower, your mechanical capabilities were limited. You could move. Great. 
Uh, but you know, we talk. We look ahead to Resident Evil now. We, you know, you can do all the things that you would in a normal first-person shooter. You can shoot. You can jump. You, no, you can't jump, can you? But you can shoot. Uh, you can. Uh, you, you have all these elements that make it similar to these other games. Uh, survival horror was is essential. One thing that you know allows it to be called survival horror is that you are mechanically powerless. Well, Pac-Man is survival horror. <laughs> <laughs> Chased by ghosts. <laughs> yeah. There are actually a couple of survival horror games that I think uh, uh, give you a surprising amount of power that um, actually many people issued the label survival horror and actually was split for things like, I don't know, Clive Barker's Undying, what was a very good first-person shooter, if you talk to some people, and for other people, a very good horror game. Um, uh, but not too many people actually do that. I, I think uh, many developers close themselves in, even as there was success pushing this horror emotion in other ways with other mechanics. Well, I mean, I think it's one of those things where we have to just talk about the difference between the trappings of horror, right, and again, the amount of horror. I don't consider a lot of the modern Resident Evils to be survival horror, right? Yeah, they're not about surviving, and they're some, about conquering. And some of the older ones are more puzzly, too. Right. And, but I mean, in a lot of the other ones, you were disempowered. It was a disempowerment fantasy, whereas modern survival, survival horror in the Resident Evil sense is a empowerment fantasy. You're blowing up zombies who are way weaker than you. So I think there is a difference. The new Tomb Raider is going to this empowerment breed, isn't it? Uh, I think we should step away from the landmine. <laughs> no, 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 no,
or even a small video of Skype and say, oh, that's a first person shooting. So maybe we need to skinner box a bunch of children. <laughs> <laughs> games and ask them to tell us what genres they are. So it's actually, it's actually really interesting. When we get down to the core of the reasons, I've been actually running a lot of tests recently, um, taking the just the MDA list of basic emotive reasons we go to things, and the human tendency, I get about a 90% hit rate for people who identify the same things in various different games. Um, it's just like the fact that we can all identify, it, even if you don't like sports, you can go to a football game and you know what parts are the most exciting. You may not find them as exciting as the person next to you, but pretty much everybody can agree on what are the most exciting parts of that football. Well, when you see me well, banging on the glass and screaming at the top of my lungs, you can see right. something's going on. And so there is actually a bunch of stuff, it's not, this isn't as, we have this big argument in video games, and you guys all know that I'm the first person to argue video games as an art, right? But it's more of an alchemy, right? It's a science and an art. And there are some ways that we can scientifically look at these things, and you do find commonalities near universal results, right? They're not gonna be universal. This is an art as well. Um, but there are ways that we can identify that. There are, there are pieces that we can find across the board. And yes, we've been trained with this terminology, right? So we're gonna use this terminology, but if you look at these things, there are commonalities that we'll agree on. For with, that, with that point about sports, though, I'm really curious to see, like, if someone who didn't know the rules of football went to a football game, right? They would know which parts of the exciting parts because everyone is cheering. But if they were there alone, would they still know that third and one with one second to go is the exciting part? You know, <laughs> would they still know? I went to at, at PAX. They had this huge Dota setup. Uh, yeah. No, it was it was League of Legends. It was setup. League. Huge, right? And people were screaming and cheering. I didn't know when exciting things were happening because the game's a blur to me, right? I don't know how to play that thing. But other people would be screaming and cheering, and then I could look at the screen and say, okay, that's sort of what it looks like when an exciting thing happens, but I didn't really understand it. So if I had been there alone, I might have just been sitting there taking a nap. Sure, because there's, so we have different baselines for excitement. This is just a quick aside, but we have different baselines for excitement, so right? You, if not knowing the rules of the league and not being interested in the league, may have had a very low bar for how exciting this was, even at its most exciting points. But you could probably, I would guess that if I asked you after that experience, you could probably identify that like the team fights were more exciting than them sitting in the shop buying stuff. Right, and we, this may be false, but yeah. we can all identify, uh, we would all draw the same graph of excitement, we would just put where it is on that excitement axis, where it's starting point is at different places. Um, and I find that fascinating, because I think there's a lot more that we can break down about design because of this true commonality of things like that. But I know we have almost no time Let's get some more questions. And on that note, actually, what I'd like to do for the last round is I'd like to do a couple, a rapid fire question, call on maybe four of you guys and have us answer tersely. Uh, so, all right. On the punctuation, no semicolons. Yeah. All right, first green jacket. Uh, James made a point earlier about uh, survival horror breaking away from the fun to be, uh, to be scary and different emotions. Do you think that it could be that at some point all the genres we have as a the majority of them might become subgenres of uh, you know kind of new words that we might come up with, or is it do you think we'll just kind of extend downwards rather than going back up? Yes. Next question. <laughs> I think we're going to go downwards. It's going to look the same as subgenreing in music. I think that's just how it's going to evolve, independent of what we would like it to evolve into. Um, it's going to look like metal. They okay. say there's only two genres in literature. Tragedy and comedy, and so we could boil them down okay. if we really want to. Dark gray sweatshirt. Okay, apropos to what you said earlier about how with survival horror, it's essentially when you're powerless. What, even though technically I don't know if this would qualify as survival horror, but when you look at the new Walking Dead game, there you were completely empowered, and it was a different dynamic where they would say, "Oh, well." You know, you want to know what it's like to be, you know, the leader of all these people in the zombie apocalypse. Okay, here's four pieces of food. There's ten people. You know, have fun trying to make everyone happy. It almost seemed like that one kind of twisted that emotion and made it that you had all the power, and yet you still felt as if not more powerless than when you were trying to conserve ammunition for Resident Evil or Veronica X. So. Right. And we can have a whole conversation. I don't know how many of you guys have played Walking Dead. I highly recommend it. Um, I believe they actually successfully bring back the adventure genre because they found a lot of the emotive reasons that they like that genre. But uh, there were great disempowerment moments, right? That's what really got me. Why don't we get Whitehead? 
Go ahead. Uh, quick question. So how do you think, do you think that hardware is actually hardware and what system a game is on greatly affects, you know, the actual design of the genre? Yes. Yes. Yep. Depends. <laughs> for now, but not for long. I think consoles are going to disappear. It's going to be commodity hardware running commodity operating systems, and then arcades will be separate from that. That's another um, discussion. Designing for a touch screen is radically different than designing for motion controls, which is radically different than a keyboard or a It's The input and the output devices are what matter, yeah. not the in between part. Correct. It's definitely an HCI question. Uh, guy in that, I can't see what that shirt is. Because you get a red bow tie on. You guys saying are you talking to me? No, the guy behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Forget you. <laughs> Back. Uh, guy in blue, blue shirt. Shirt. Not uh, <laughs> Gamer guy. <laughs> I was going to ask, uh, do you think the difference in genre terminology between film and video games might have to do with the fact that in film, a lot of those genre terms came out of the academic press, things like the Cahiers du Cinema in France, and a lot of the terminology we use in games comes out of the commercial press? Yes, yes. 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 And the amateur hobbyist press. I think it's just a factor of video games are too new. It was amateur filmmaking for a long time. It became academic later. We need 100 years for academia to become as entrenched. It wasn't until the critics in France really said film's an art form that they started really thinking about it in that way. Um, People used to film clocks because that was just amazing to them that they could see time progressing from the past. Okay, well, this will be the last question, but let me emphasize that uh, we'll all stick around for a little bit afterwards. Everybody, including the guy in the blue shirt, should come up and talk to us. <laughs> yeah, you. Okay, um, you mentioned the difference between third person and first person in shooters. That also exists in racing games where you drive, like you drive cars or any other car game. Do you see there being a split between first person, like car games, and third person car games? Well, I mean, you know, if you ever played Virtual Racing, it was the first one where you push the button to change the camera. Yeah, that's the same Right? It's the same genre no matter which button you press. You know, you're still testing the same skills. Turn the wheel precisely, step on the pedal precisely. I don't think racing games are popular enough right now to have a pure divergence between simulation and arcade. I think those are the only splits we've got right now. Okay. With that, we're going we're gonna to shut it down. Let's give our panelists a hand. We'll stick around up here. I think I speak for us all, and I said we'll be here all weekend. <laughs> <laughs>